A hundred years is not a long time for a forest or prairie. A mere blink of an eye for a river or a mountain. But for human beings, centuries are huge, spanning generations. Time enough for towns to grow into cities. Roads widen into highways. And fields and woods make way for suburbs and industry. One hundred years ago, the people of Missouri decided to create a state park system to preserve the natural wilderness of one of the most ecologically diverse states in America. And today that system consists of more than 90 parks and historic sites. And though it would not be possible to visit all of them in a half hour, we can get a sense of the breadth of landscapes and terrains, rivers and lakes, and historic sites that have been set aside to preserve natural Missouri while offering us places to relax, enjoy, share, and create memories. These places belong to you. Our story begins in 1917 a year when the major concern of most Americans was the nation's inevitable entry into the First World War. From our perspective today, those times seem simpler and slower. But in the early years of the 20th century, there was a widespread sense that traditional rural America was being replaced by a new fast-paced society of cities and machines, that the country was losing touch with the natural world that played so great a part in the shaping of the American spirit. Across the country, a movement was growing to set aside some of the untouched land so it could retain its rustic beauty for everyone, particularly those who lived in the country's growing cities. So even in the midst of the nation's preparations for war, the Missouri General Assembly passed a measure that would fund what would someday become a system of state parks. The country as a whole was changing. We were moving away from our agricultural roots. We were moving off the family farm into, into more urban settings, which took us away from, from our roots, from, from where we came from, from, from how we defined ourselves. Um, our country was founded on this ideal of, of the westward movement and the frontier, and, and we were losing that as we were becoming more urban. So as a, as a state and as a nation, actually, we chose to, to create this system to preserve and protect these lands, but also give us an opportunity to revisit those roots, to return to where we came from. Improvements in urban working conditions were introducing new concepts into Americans' lives, such as the weekend and the vacation. And a new invention was catching on which was making it a lot easier to get out of town. The invention of the automobile was huge. It allowed us to go places, and then suddenly we're paving roads, we have the highway system, and, and people are traveling in a way they never, never even conceived before. Moving to the city, moving to a, an urban or manufacturing society introduced these new concepts of things like the work week. So you're only working five or six days a week, and suddenly you have a weekend. Or, or you have vacation time, so this idea of leisure is, is new. And to be able to go someplace is, is very exciting. And, and you have the ability to travel, so your life isn't a square mile or a township, it's the entire state, maybe even the entire country. And the state park system gave people a place to go. In fact, the state's first historic sites developed from the idea that as more people bought automobiles, they'd be looking for places to visit. As far back as the 1820s, the village of Arrow Rock took advantage of its location on the Missouri River to serve the growing numbers of European settlers heading west. The Santa Fe Trail originated not far from Arrow Rock, and it was a convenient place for wagon trains to cross the river and join the trail which passed through town. By the 1830s, the Arrow Rock Tavern which is still in business today, was offering would-be pioneers a hot meal and a drink before heading for parts west. In the 1920s, it occurred to a group of local women 
long before there was any serious thought of creating a state park system, to advertise the tavern and the town as a destination for a new group of adventurers, motorists. The Daughters of the American Revolution took an interest in this community and specifically in the tavern because of its association with the Santa Fe Trail. They developed in 1912 a, a, a national road society. In other words, they were going to convert all the old pioneer trails into a coast-to-coast -coast highway because of the advent of the automobile. Automobile traffic started coming in and actually is kind of the birthplace of historic preservation and heritage tourism both. In the early 20s, the state acquired surrounding land. And today, the Arrow Rock State Historic Site is a charming blend of a park and a town, a time capsule of antebellum Missouri. Its name refers to the earliest Native American residents who chiseled flint for tools and weapons from a nearby bluff. It was the home of 19th century painter George Caleb Bingham and the renowned Lyceum Repertory Theater. Southern in character, it was occupied by the Union Army during the Civil War and was an important center of 19th century African American culture. There was an African American population here, a sizable one. Um, they had a schoolhouse, they had an AME church, they helped build it. As time went on, they went on to other larger towns, moving most, mostly to Kansas City. But still, it's a place that African Americans still can come back to and go, we had a place here. We have roots here. You know, that's why I just love, you know, when we say Missouri State Park, it's your park too. It is everyone's park. We all had something to do with building this town. We all had something to do with the park. We not only preserve and interpret history, uh, we're very much a, a cultural activity center. We do have recreational facilities. We've got a campground. We've got a fishing lake. We've got hiking trails. So there's a wide variety of activities that we, we do here in, in this community and in our uh, state park facility. Another very different kind of state park and historic site lies on the edge of the prairie just north of Kansas City, Watkins Woolen Mill. A visit to the mill and the surrounding property is a trip back to the early days of Missouri's steam and animal-powered industry. I think what makes Watkins Woolen Mill State Park and State Historic Site unique is the fact that we have really the only 19th century textile mill in North America that you can see with all the original machinery. The site is the former farm and mill of Waltus Watkins, who moved here in 1839 and began farming the rich prairie soil. He built a large house from lumber he cut from nearby woods and bricks which he made himself. He constructed the mill in 1861 and from over 50 machines produced shawls, blankets, quality fabrics and yarns. During the Civil War, the mill was kept busy producing material for the Union Army. Well, it's phenomenal to walk through. I think it is like stepping back in time. That's a cliche, but I think you see it right here. You're walking into a 19th century building as much as it would have been as you would have seen it at that time with all the machinery here. The mill closed in 1898. When the area became a park and historic site in the 1960s, it was restored as it would have been in the 1870s. The machinery is still in working condition. What I always enjoy is seeing people who walk in the door because they don't know what to expect. Many times I've never been in a factory, let alone a 19th century textile factory. And then there's that oh wow moment as I call it. They walk in, they see the first floor of the machinery and then they go to the upper floors and there's more machinery and then the interpreter will tell the story, how the machinery is utilized, what's the process. We have tours of small school children that come through. We have enthusiasts that are involved in spinning and weaving that will come through that they kind of want to see how it was done a hundred years ago. If you're interested in history, it's an ideal place to come. Mm -hmm. 
Roaring River State Park in the far southwestern corner of the state is 4,200 acres of rugged and mountainous terrain carved out by the White River. More than half of the park is maintained in its original wild state, and its isolated location is home to more than 600 species of plant life, many of which cannot be found in any other region of the state. From Roaring River Spring, originating in a deep gorge behind a cliff, gush 20 million gallons of water a day. The spring pool at the park is where Roaring River begins, and it's a gorgeous part of the park. Several years ago, a team of divers decided to find out how deep the spring really was. And by the time they were done, they found that the spring was 224 feet deep. That water that's coming up is pure water. When it shows up, it looks a deep blue. It gives it almost a Caribbean look when you go to the spring area. We have uh, 10 miles of trails at Roy River State Park, and the trail that is probably visited the most is the Devil's Kitchen Trail. And you go through a variety of different ecosystems as you go through there, and there are several caves that you can visit. Devil's Kitchen is a formation of rocks that through the centuries have fallen down on top of each other and give you this sense of incredible awe. And for those who love to fish, Roaring River with its hatcheries and waterways has been a popular destination since the early 1900s. History and architecture buffs enjoy visiting the many facilities constructed by the Civilian Conservation Corps. The CCC was created by the federal government in 1933 at the height of the Great Depression to employ young men between the ages of 18 and 25 in national and state parks, building dining lodges, picnic shelters, cabins, and campgrounds. We're very proud of our Civilian Conservation Corps presence at Roaring River State Park. They built several parts of the park that are still used and viable today. You are living and walking through history when you walk through the park. Another of the state's outstanding spots for fishing, particularly for trout, is Bennett Spring State Park, which was established in 1924. The spring has been the site of several mills since the 1830s. In the 1930s, the Civilian Conservation Corps made a number of improvements in the park, including a stone bridge, which, according to legend, was built so that its three arches spelled out a sideways CCC. Just upstream from the bridge, a dam allows control of the water level of the stream, so it's always constant and just right for fishing, which typically begins at the crack of dawn. Missouri is blessed with an unusual diversity of natural ecosystems. Just north of the low mountains and thick forests of the Ozarks is Prairie State Park, a striking contrast to the land that surrounds it. At one time, a third of Missouri was covered with tall grass prairie. And today, there is less than 1% remaining. And majority of that tall grass landscape is right here at Prairie State Park. So it is a unique and historical landscape. We have approximately 100 head of bison, and we have about 25 head of elk that roam throughout the area. The bison are a huge attraction here to the park. Bulls can weigh up to 2,000 pounds or a ton. Um, they're very quick. Bison, um, as a species, can run about 35 miles an hour. Prairie State Park is just shy of 4,000 acres, and many of those acres within that are true remnants. The ground has never been turned by a plow. It's a unique landscape that you just don't see, and it's a vastness. But it's an experience that's unlike any other because it's so remote and just the sense of openness. I think it can transport you back in time to some degree. I have a tendency to think it's a little romantic. <laughs> 
I always bring myself to think, what would it have been like to cross this in the late 1800s? Missouri is not just diverse in terms of its landscape, but in its cultures as well. Part urban, part rural, with flavors of both the North and the South. But the creation and success of Missouri State Parks over the past century is grounded in a widespread popular commitment to preserving the best of our natural world. When state and federal funding for the system was threatened in the 1980s, voters approved a one-tenth of one cent sales tax to support the parks and the state's soil conservation program. Which is why there is no entrance fee into the state parks system. Anybody can come and enjoy the state parks with no cost, and that's very unusual around the country in, in which there usually is an entrance fee. Missouri is a very special place in that regard, that its citizens have always valued our natural resources, have always valued those special and unique places. And since its inception in 1917, the system has steadily grown in size and in the range of amenities it offers, as the state has purchased land and philanthropists committed to conservation have donated their own private property for the enjoyment of all. Time and time again, we have been ranked in the top four state park systems in all the nation, and that says something. In the last few years, we have been named best trail state, best camping state. Sometimes families think they have to go out of state to a faraway destination to really go on a family vacation. But what more and more Missouri families are discovering is that all that they could ever possibly ask for in the way of adventure is right here in the state. Somewhere in the Missouri State Park System, there is an adventure awaiting. One of the state's most popular and unusual parks is Johnson Shut-Ins, a unique geological formation of stones and water. About a billion and a half years ago, volcanoes in this area started forming the, the land. And then throughout the years, it's a shut-in area, which means that the water has to flow within a certain area, and it's formed the rocks that you see behind. In December of 2005, a reservoir owned by the utility Ameren UE breached, pouring more than a billion gallons of water into the park. Following a settlement of over a hundred million dollars, the shut-ins were restored to their former state. Our visitation from Memorial Day to Labor Day is probably 250,000. And people love to come down here because it's so unique. You know, you got the natural water slides and the, and the waterfalls, and it's something you can't see anywhere out in the world, just about. And of course, the state park system is more than just preservation or protection of our natural resources. It's, it's about, their, about having fun. There's so much to do. You can go hiking, you can go biking, you can go kayaking. There's, there's camping, there's, there's these beautiful lodges that entire families spend time together. This becomes part of the tradition of the family. And the Lake of the Ozark State Park, with its woods, caves, rivers, hills, and of course miles of shorelines and coves, offers all those recreational opportunities and more. The lake itself was created in the 1930s by Union Electric, now Ameren UE. The federal government developed a recreation area on the lake, which was donated to the state after World War II. The Lake of the Ozarks is a unique place. Nowhere else in the state will visitors find such a collection of springs, caves, interesting geological formations, and wildlife, all part of that shared Missouri experience. Missouri also has the distinction of having the longest and skinniest state park in America. 240 miles in length and about 100 feet wide, Katy Trail State Park runs along the bed of the old Missouri-Kansas-Texas or Katy Railroad from St. Charles, Missouri 
all the way to the town of Clinton, south of Kansas City. The Katy Trail attracts bikers and hikers from across America and around the world, passing not just through the geography of the state, but its history as well, through farmland and forests, along the Missouri River, through old railroad and river towns, to larger cities like Boonville and Jefferson City. However visitors travel the Katy, it is a rare journey into places and times that can no longer be found in the big cities, offering glimpses of a past where the pace of life was slower and quieter and more in tune with the rhythms of the natural world. There are numerous state parks and historic sites within an easy drive of metropolitan St. Louis, among them Babbler, Castlewood, and Confluence State Park, where the Missouri and Mississippi rivers converge. But just on the northern edge of downtown St. Louis is a very different kind of historic site, the Scott Joplin House, the former home of a great American composer. He moved to St. Louis from Sedalia, Missouri in about 1901. He lived here about two and a half years to three years. He lived in the apartment upstairs. He wrote significant amounts of work here. Scott Joplin's very important because of the musical legacy that he leaves. The introduction of ragtime music as the first popular American music. The Scott Joplin House demonstrates the very wide range of parks and historical sites that make up the park system. No bluffs, streams, or forests here, but a special place in its own way, in an urban center, honoring the achievements of a Missouri artist, interpreting the place and the times in which he lived. You would see the apartment that he actually lived in, experience a tour with a tour guide that would answer it most questions that you could possibly ask about ragtime or to Scott Joplin's time here in Missouri. We honor important people, but we also honor historical achievements and historical perspectives. We're doing that at Scott Joplin House. One of the more recent additions to the state park system is Echo Bluff, located among the hills and woods of the Missouri Ozarks. Echo Bluff's most outstanding feature is a sheer wall of rock rising dramatically above a bend in Sinking Creek. The park offers a variety of vacation options, from rustic to comfortable, with the expectations of 21st century park visitors in mind. Some St. Louisans will remember the site as the old Camp Zoo, a children's summer camp. Echo Bluff provides something for folks who say, you know, I'd love to get in the out of doors, I'd love to go and enjoy nature, but I also like the comforts of home. And so Echo Bluff with a beautiful lodge, uh, the, the brand new cabins, wonderful restaurant, it allows those nicer amenities, but you're in the midst of the Ozarks. You're in the midst of Sinking Creek and the Current River watershed. You're in the midst of nature at its very best. There is something for everyone. You just have to get out there and you'll fall in love with the state park system for sure. The idea of providing something for everyone has endured now for over a hundred years. And each state park and historic site in every corner of Missouri is a reminder that no matter who we are or where we live, there is much that we share. These are places that belong to all of us. And setting aside the best and most beautiful parts of our state to appreciate and enjoy should never be taken for granted. This is a hundred years, it's, it's our legacy. It's the thing that we share, it's the thing that we preserve, it's the one thing that makes us all family. 
we have an obligation to preserve and protect and pass it on to the generations after, just like the generations before pass it on to us. I think in our fast-paced world today, when we have so many electronic gadgets and other things that crowd the mind, we are all looking for those places to settle down, find quiet and peace and tranquility, and reconnect with the very best of us. And most of us find that to some aspect in nature. All of the richness and beauty, from the Ozark Hills to the prairie, the streams and forests. These are the places that hold the very heart of what is most beautiful and valuable in the place we live. And as we enjoy all they have to offer us, we will celebrate those who created it and nurtured it for over a hundred years and commit ourselves to the continuation of their good work into the next century.